Creating your own Dungeons & Dragons setting can be an incredibly daunting task for anyone. This is especially true if you're trying to make a setting for an old school style campaign, where you have a vast open world that players can explore in any way that they want. Where do you even start? You start by mapping out an entire continent, figuring out its geology and its ecosystems. Do you start with building a realistic culture and an economy that makes sense? Do you start out with mythology and history, building up a setting that feels like it has depth and roots? Fortunately, we have a detailed step-by-step -step guide written by someone who spent years of his life running these kinds of campaigns, Gary Gygax. In the April 1975 issue of Europa magazine, the co-creator of D&D wrote an article with the delightful title, How to Set Up Your Dungeons and Dragons Campaign and Be Stuck Refereeing It Seven Days a Week Until the Wee Hours of the Morning. In it, he proposes five basic steps that you should follow in order to get a campaign up and running. The crucial thing here is the up and running part. Building a vast, detailed, Middle-Earth-like world can be a trap for dungeon masters. Almost all of us love world building, and it can suck us in so much that we forget that we only really need to build the stuff that the players interact with. In other words, we don't need to build a world, but a neighborhood. A small, local sandbox packed with enough adventure that players can play there for weeks without having to venture out. By the time that they do, we will have enough experience running this new world that expanding it will be a piece of cake because we will no longer be creating in a vacuum, but in a world that already feels real and concrete and has a history partially formed by the players. Before we dig into Gary's five steps though, this video is brought to you by the Afterthought Committee and their funnel adventure for old school essentials, Zed and Two Knots. Trapped aboard a vessel crewed by prophecy-driven shapeshifters, unfortunate souls must band together or perish. Fight brutal monsters, avoid devastating traps, and test your wits against an inscrutable enemy. Use the links in the description below to check out Zed and Two Knots at Exalted Funeral, and keep an eye out for Tangled, their next funnel adventure, coming soon. Alright, here's the five steps that Gary proposes for getting your campaign started. Number one, create the overall setting concept. Two, create the immediate region that the players start in. Three, map out at least three levels of a mega dungeon for the players to explore. Number four, create the layout and inhabitants of the town nearest to the dungeon. And then five, slowly begin expanding the world from there as needed. Now we're going to go through these, but if you want to follow along and build your own D&D campaign, one of the best resources you can use is this free booklet called the Gygax 75 Challenge. I'll put a link to it down in the description below. It contains both Gygax's original article and a five-week program created by Ray Otis for using Gygax's advice to make a setting that you can play. If you're new to this and you want each step broken down into tasks with uh, check boxes and concrete examples, it's a fantastic resource. It's a great way to give yourself some structure and to shepherd you through until the end. Huge shout out to Ray for creating it. Step one, the concept. What you're really aiming for here is an elevator pitch. You want something snappy, memorable, and exciting. You should be able to explain this concept to a potential player and have them immediately get the gist of what it will be about and whether it will be right for them. Is it going to be high fantasy or a grim dark slog through mud and blood? What races or classes will be allowed? What are some weird features about the setting that make it unique? What are all the major forces within the campaign world that the party could ally with or oppose? Think about aesthetics and tone as well. Create a mood board on Pinterest with images of monsters, places, and NPCs that would fit within this setting. Think about books, movies, music, and video games that have a similar vibe. Doing all of this will not only get the players amped up, but also provide the limitations and the boundaries that you need to inspire creativity and to fight writer's block. For example, think about a setting like Dark Sun. The tone is gritty, savage, and survivalist. It has all of the standard races, but many of them have twists, like halflings being cannibals. Psionics are in, the gods are out, and arcane spellcasters are hated and shunned. Unusual features include the lack of metal weapons, city-states run by mad sorcerer kings, and the existence of only one dragon. The aesthetics are basically fantasy Mad Max. With just that short description, you've painted a vivid world for the players and given yourself a solid foundation to build on. Step two, build the local area. To start building the local adventuring region, you're going to need a hex map. You can either print out a hex map grid to draw on, or use one of the many free hex map tools that you can find online. I'll put some links down in the description below. Now, when I'm building a hex map, I usually think in terms of six mile hexes, but Gary actually recommends that you use a one mile hex for this zone. 
This allows you to get a good amount of detail and prevents you from creating a region that's too large. Ray Otis's workbook recommends using a 23 by 14 grid. With a map of that size, a party of characters should be able to get anywhere on the map within one day. I would use a variety of terrain types like forests, hills, lakes, and so on in order to create some meaningful choices as to what direction the party explores. You're also going to want points of interest to investigate. Probably the two most important are the main settlement in the region and the entrance to a dungeon which I would place half a day's journey away at most. Feel free to throw in a few other interesting locations as well, like some minor settlements, a witch's hut, a goblin camp, or a magical standing stone, and so on. In order to make exploring this area interesting, you're also going to want a random encounter table. You can design this any way that you want, but using a table that uses a bell curve like 2d6 or 3d6 can be a good idea because you want to make sure that you can create encounters that are more likely and less likely. Try to get a mix of human and non-human encounters, and don't make all of them necessarily hostile either. Encountering bandits that are too lazy or too fearful to attack can actually be a lot more interesting than a fight. But also, don't be afraid of throwing something really dangerous on there, like a dragon. Don't have a dragon just drop out of the sky and eat them. That wouldn't offer any interesting choices for the party. But having a dragon fly by, or just land nearby, can be great for increasing a sense of wonder and for making things feel like a real adventure. I have a whole video on random encounters if you want to dig more into this. Step three, building the dungeon. No old school campaign is complete without a tentpole mega dungeon. These dungeons are the lifeblood of a campaign because they provide an enormous amount of adventure density. A single well fleshed out level of a dungeon provides gameplay for weeks with a minimal prep time on your end. Gary recommends that you flesh out three levels to get started, and that seems very reasonable to me. Three levels is enough to demonstrate to the players that this dungeon has depth, that you can go deeper and deeper and encounter more danger and more rewards, while still leaving plenty of room to expand things as you get more ideas. I have several videos going in depth on how to design old school dungeons, so I'll just hit some of the highlights here. Each level should have a theme of some kind to make them distinct from the others and add variety as the players explore vertically. Gary famously stated that level 12 of his mega dungeon, Castle Greyhawk, was full of dragons. Ray's workbook recommends 7 to 12 rooms per dungeon level, but that's much too low for me personally. I would start out with 20 to 40 rooms per level in order to give the party real room to explore. Remember that not every room has to have something in it, but a good mix of monsters, NPCs, treasure, tricks, traps, and general strangeness is a good idea to keep the players excited and guessing what's behind the next door. You can also help foster exploration by connecting the rooms in a network structure rather than a linear or a tree-like one. There should be multiple ways to get to most rooms and paths that let you work your way around obstacles. A lot of DMs like to design the dungeon on paper, but there's plenty of easy to use online tools that can really speed up this process. The final thing you need is a wandering monster table for each dungeon level, similar to the ones that you made for the overworld. However, the deeper the dungeon level, the more dangerous the monsters generally are. A good rule of thumb is that monsters on level two should be a good challenge for level two PCs and so on, but you don't have to stick to this precisely. Encountering things that are much weaker or tougher than the party can make for the best encounters. Step four, build the town. Every mega dungeon needs a nearby town to act as a base of operations where the PCs can rest and resupply. But it can also be the site of even more adventure depending on how much detail you want to put into it. The bare bones of a town should include several shops where players can buy weapons, armor and equipment, a place for them to sleep, a place for them to hire help, and a place to hear rumors and quest hooks. In theory, all of these could be the same location, but it's usually more fun to break them up in order to add more flavor and more NPCs to talk to. Gary also recommended adding locations themed around the different character classes, like a thieves guild, uh, a temple to horrible deities, a forbidden wizard's tower, or a league of fighters. This would give the PCs each ways to explore their background, get training, and form alliances. You can make things even more exciting and dynamic by adding rival political factions, gambling halls full of people looking to swindle the party from their hard-earned money, and even gangs from nearby settlements clashing in the street. Most of all, remember that towns are the place where most of the role-playing is likely to happen. The party can certainly encounter interesting NPCs in the wilderness or in the dungeon, but the town is where most of the theatrical players will likely gravitate towards. So make sure to put plenty of NPCs in there with interesting backgrounds, goals, and secrets. Bonus points if those NPCs can be recruited to the party. 
And that's it. You now have everything you need to launch a full-scale open-world campaign. This material should keep you going for months, with only some minor prep between sessions to update the world based on the player's actions. Once you feel comfortable with how things are going and the players begin looking out into the wider world, you can start moving on to step five. Step five, build the world. Step five is the step that continues on for the remainder of the campaign, where you gradually flesh out the rest of your continent, your planet, and universe. Some of the elements that most campaign worlds will eventually need include a pantheon of gods, a list of high-level NPCs and villains, a calendar to track feast days and other important events, the political systems of nearby kingdoms, artifacts and magic items to seal, and plenty of rival factions to make trouble for the party. Generally, it's best to focus on the parts of the world that the players are the most interested in. But if you get inspired to map out the geography of your entire setting all at once, then go for it. So that's how Gygax recommended you start a campaign world. If you want to read his original article and get that free booklet I mentioned, check out the link in the description below. Also, let me know in the comments what your process was like when starting your own campaign. Before we go, a shout out to all of the new Questing Beast patrons who joined the Patreon in April. I couldn't do this without them. They are Vic Jim, Kai Yao, Ali Pali, Reluctant Artsy, Nicole Vanderhoven, Tornado Fur, Steve Nix, Asher, Luke H, Christian Taylor, Patrick Mullen, Mattia D. Chiolo, Dice Monkey, Antoine Fournier, Colin Kahn, Spring Villager, Paper, Herschel, Joshua Allen, K. David Ladage, Tristan Skilding, Nicholas Sokland, Raoul, Andreas Johansson, Joseph Braxton, Jordan Nigren, Gilligan, Game Master Circle, Rod Nedlows, Ethan Kemeny, Russell Cox, Fnord Friendly, Chris Gilbert, Stephen Nickel, Chris Sr., Richie Walker, Max Martin, Alexander Barrett, and Robert DeLuca. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, everyone, and thanks to you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.